Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast Show, the place to hear stories from global influencers, trailblazers, cutting edge visionaries, and empowered entrepreneurs from all walks of life for examples of living an incredible life. Um, please feel free to subscribe, share, and listen often. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the notification bell so you're notified whenever a new episode is released. So today, I have the privilege of introducing Terry Pierce. Welcome to the podcast, Terry. Hi, Kimberly. Yeah, welcome. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. No, it's really good to be here. Yes, and where are we talking to you from? So I'm in London, in East London. All right, awesome. So I just want to read your bio so people can know who you are and what we're going to talk about. So Terry Pierce has been in learning and development since 2000. After five years progressing from delivering to managing training in the UK's National Health Service, he started freelancing as a consultant. Terry has worked with huge, a huge range of organizations over the last 15 years across the world. During that time, he started to realize that what he was best at, enjoyed most, was designing and training. Since that, re, um, since that realization, his last 10 years of freelancing have been a process of ever-increasing specialization. First, focusing on training design, and more recently, on designing learning experiences using game-based learning and gamification. Now that Terry is focusing on this, he feels like he has really found his passion. Terry has always played games and love working out how they tick, and he loved helping people get ideas and develop their skills. Being a games-based learning designer and consultant brings the two together. All right, so I like to hear more about this because I'm all about having fun in games. Games are just like an integral part of life. I mean, you grow up uh, learning, playing games with friends. Um, our family had like game nights, you know, <laughs> where we just sit down and play games and, and have fun. So really love to get into this. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love talking about it. Um, I think, uh, you know, so many people that I talk to like you, you know, they remember games from their childhood and they remember play a lot from their childhood. And there's this kind of perception that as we get older, you know, we, we need to kind of put that to one side and become a bit more serious. And, and, and I think that's a real shame. I think there's so much that we can get from games and from playfulness uh, as adults and as professionals. Um, and, you know, obviously my big focus, in, in, as you were talking about there in my intro, uh, is about how that helps us in learning. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So just so people can get to know you, tell us a little bit about you, how you started out, because I know you didn't start out in games. So how you started out and how you got to be doing what you're doing now. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, yeah, just to expand a little bit on what you, you said in, in the bio and the intro. Uh, I mean, I found myself uh, after university, I did, I did my uh, degree in photography, which I, I really enjoyed. It kind of engaged my, my creative uh, streak. But once I started to look into kind of the, the careers that were available in photography and the options available to me, I, I couldn't see anything kind of uh, that, that I wanted to move into straight away. So I kind of just took a day job, really. Uh, while I was kind of considering my options and then as part of that day job which was working in telecoms uh, there was a, a secondment that came up to uh, to train other people in what I was doing um, so you know it just sounded interesting I thought I'd give it a try and that turned out to be pretty pretty fateful um, because you know training training and development is what I've been doing ever since and that was uh, you know over 20 years ago um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a little bit of a coincidence, a little bit of a kind of random, or oh, I, I think I'll just try this for the sake of it kind of thing, but uh, I kind of took to it, uh, seemed to be quite good at it and, and, and really enjoy it because, uh, I, I, you know, found that I really enjoyed, uh, well, I really enjoyed the process of learning and helping other people and seeing that kind of spark of learning in other people. Um, so that was kind of my entry into, into learning and development. Um, and then that, that kind of, uh, that kind of phrase that you use there in the, in the bio, about an ever increasing process of specialism has really been the story of the kind of, uh, of the last 20 years, going from kind of delivering and, and working in all areas of uh, training and development uh, and, and being a training manager, down to, to really focusing on the parts of it that really kind of give me a buzz, uh, which first of all was design uh, mm -hmm. and kind of the, the creative kind of process of, of working out how to get a concept or some content uh, across to people in a way that they really find engaging and that really works um, and then specializing even further down from that to uh, using that using games to do that 
So I'm just curious, you know, as a child growing up, what were the things that you enjoyed doing or what did you play at or what were the games that you engaged in that you think that might have given you that spark for what you're doing now? Sure. I mean, all kinds, really. I mean, you think you, you kind of standard kind of uh, kids kind of uh, make believe play kind of. Um, but I do remember a couple of things in particular. Uh, I remember when I was uh, apparently I think I was about nine years old when I noticed uh, my mum playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons with her friends. Uh, and obviously I was really curious, what is all this? How does this work? Uh, and it wasn't too long before I was joining in and, and playing Dungeons and Dragons. And I kind of have played Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing, tabletop role-playing games uh, ever since. Um, so that was a big one for me, uh, both like the playing of it, but also that the kind of, I remember in particular creating characters, creating these personalities and, and what, what their abilities were and things like that. And then what they're you know, seeing, what they could do. That was huge for me. Um, but also kind of more strategic kind of games as well. I do that, enjoy that side of things. And I, at chess was a huge thing for me at school. I was captain of the school chess team. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember getting a lot out of that when I was a kid. Uh, but yeah, all kinds of games as well. Computer games, uh, you know, really simple games, puzzles as well, which are not exactly games, but there's some kind of, you know, overlap there. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking and you said the word imagination, you know, a lot of times as adults, we're not really encouraged to use our imagination, but I found from my background, I'm a behavioral optometrist, you know, visualizing, you know, what you want and how you want things to go and actually strategizing through that visualization is very, very helpful. How do you use that imagination in the games that you're creating? Um, I mean, I what I often the process that I often find myself working through once I know the kind of objectives what what the the game or the, the learning experience is supposed to achieve is to look at different uh, kind of building blocks for that so different kind of game mechanics different ways that things can be set up um, and I think the imagination really is it is in imagining and, and to some extent visualizing yes um, the way that those could fit together uh, and and particular new ways that those could fit together because you can definitely kind of just repackage or redo things that have already been done but that gets old and tired fairly quickly and, and, and what really gives me a buzz is you know finding something that's really new and interesting and makes people sit up and go oh wow mm -hmm. so how do you personally get into that creative space where you're you're creating and you're discovering or however you do it something new how do you get into that and then how do those ideas come mm. Yeah, it's a really difficult one. I, I, I've, I've thought a lot about this uh, because it's a question that creators get asked a lot. And, and if you're kind of ever, ever administering around creators and, and you know, budgeting for time for a creative project, for instance, then you have to start thinking about those kind of things. You know, when does it happen? How does it happen? How long is it going to take? And it's really tough. Um, the best I can do for myself is uh, make the environment, I think, as, as, as good as it can be. So that's, uh, you know, the environment around me, my, my, my surroundings but also things like uh, my kind of mood and the time. So uh, best creative time for me is early in the morning. You know, if I get up and at it at kind of seven in the morning, then um, I'm, I'm, you know, all kinds of stuff starts to flow generally if I've, if I've got a, a project that I can get my teeth into. But if I start something like that at three or four in the afternoon, it's just not gonna happen uh, for me. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of setting things up, creating the environment, uh, understanding the parameters, I think, is huge. You know, if, if, I think for most people, if you ask them to be creative in a blank space, just do something creative, draw something creative, write something creative, then people find it really tough. Mm -hmm. But if you've got parameters, if you've got rules, if you've got restrictions, and you're, if you're really clear on those, to clear what, where the creative space is between those, then I think that's really inspiring for me. It's like we go to the gym to work out. You go to your creative space, to create yeah so um i'm just wondering when you wake up in the morning do you go straight away and do your work or do you have a morning practice there's a lot of people that have like a morning practice to get them in that mindset if you will and then they do their work and there's other people just like they just go straight away they're going to start the work yeah i don't really have a morning routine as such i do find sometimes uh doing something uh, mundane is quite useful actually just kind of hanging out the washing or something like that is me getting myself moving and, and some momentum 
but my mm. brain is free to kind of do its thing. Um, I guess the, the main thing, actually, probably even more so than that, though, is 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 not a positive, but a negative. It's it's to not get caught up in surfing the internet or looking on Facebook or things like that, because those kind of things kind of fragment my uh, attention. I think, and and you know, all those all those uh, juices that could be flowing in a really creative direction are actually then kind of thinking about all this thing in politics that I just read or, or whatever. You know, kind of thing. So yeah, mm-hmm. avoid that. So when you're creating something new, um, do you sit down and just those ideas start flowing and you start, you know, going on the computer or how do you do that? Do you, you know, some people like, for example, at Disney, they use storyboards, you know, how do you, how do you put things together? Yeah, no, I'm very much uh, in those initial stages. I'm very much paper based. Uh, I do like using computers and I like uh, finding the right app. To, to do something creative and I've, I've got lots of different kind of uh, processes and flows that are used for particular things but those that's usually further down the road if it's initial kind of uh, let's get all my ideas together then it's often a process of a, a, a nice sheet of paper lots of colors I've got a you know, huge amount of uh, different colors that I use to kind of uh, put all my ideas out in a kind of mind map kind of style and um, yeah then just kind of putting as many different things that seem relevant and following links and associations. And then, so it's a kind of, uh, you know, expansive thinking and then contracting down and narrowing and saying, okay, these ones seem to work or these ones seem to work with these ones. Got it. Yeah. And you talked about actually specializing and narrowing your focus. Um, Talk more about that. Sure. Yeah. so I think uh, what, what was quite interesting for me about all of that was um, that I had a misperception, I think, uh, particularly going into business on my own. So for the first five years of my uh, learning and development career, I was working uh, within organizations, mainly within the NHS, uh, National Health Service in the UK. Um, and then when I went uh, uh, on my own as a consultant 15 years ago, my initial thinking was, OK, I've got to offer as much as I possibly can to as many people as I possibly can, because otherwise I'm turning down opportunities. Um, So I would, you know, say, yep, I can deliver all your training needs. I can do the design. I can do the management of the project. I can deliver it, uh, everything. Um, And, you know, that worked fairly well to to some extent, and it's given me lots of really interesting experiences and a real breadth of experience. Um, But I think it also, you know, uh, divided up my attention and meant that I was, you know, uh, looking at a lot of different things and, and I'm not amazing at all of them I'm pretty good at some of them and better at others um, and what I started to find as I was going on was that uh, the projects that went best and uh, the work that people wanted me to do more of was the work that was design focused uh, of me creating things not sometimes for me to run but sometimes for other people to run or sometimes an experience that kind of just worked in its own right uh, but putting that together putting the ideas together designing it just really, I enjoyed it. The results seemed better. And the more that I did that, the more I wanted to do of it. And then there was a kind of, uh, relatively recently actually, a kind of, uh, I think a revelation moment for me, which was that actually by specializing and by marketing and branding myself more as a specialist, it didn't actually restrict me in business terms. It actually kind of freed me because instead of having to focus on all these other things, there's still plenty of opportunities in business out there in that specialist area, but now I get to, you know, talk about it uh, with more authority, with more enthusiasm, uh, and do the things that I really love doing, um, and get the kind of results that give me, you know, good, um, you know, good press basically, um, and all of that, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just so much, uh, so much better on a day-to-day basis than trying to do all these things and juggling all these balls at once. Wonderful. And the big question, what is it that makes games and playing so fun and so motivating? Like we, you know, you don't have to really talk people into, you know, playing a game of tennis or, or, you know, you just have to talk people into it. Like, you know, if you have work to do, it's like, oh, (laughs) but, but playing, everybody wants to play. Yeah. I think there are a lot of reasons and there are there are different types of players and different motivators for different people Uh, and there's a whole load of theory I could go into that we probably won't have time for around that but I do think that there's there's a few things that are common for most people and and particularly in a work context I think one of them is 
that it takes this kind of pressure of getting it right first time away. You know, if you play a game, nobody really expects you, unless you're playing at a really high professional level, um, to get it right first time, to be perfect, to win every time. Uh, and in fact, a good game, you won't beat it first time, otherwise it's a bit boring and you know, <laughs> doesn't really challenge you. So you're given this license to kind of fail and to try new things out and to have a little bit of fun and not just to go straight for the goal with your professional reputation at stake if you get it wrong. Um, and I think people like that freedom. Uh, and it, and you know, in my field in particular, in learning, that's huge because if you want people to learn, they need to be open to learning rather than thinking, I've got to get this right because then they'll just use the ways that they've always used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even the games promote creativity with people, with their learning styles, with their how they're learning. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Uh, you know, the again, there's the, the different kind of styles. Some people like, for instance, the kind of uh, the sense of achievement that you get from uh, points and particular achievements within games. Other people like, you know, games or, or playful experiences where they can kind of create things, create worlds, create communities. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different ones there, but games are so broad that they offer all of these things, and, and particularly good ones offer all of their things uh, for you to choose from and you can focus on the part of the game that suits your personality. Mm -hmm. When you're creating these games, are they also used for like team building or just getting people to kind of work together? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, the team building ones in many ways are the easiest ones to design. In fact, uh, if you're designing around a, a topic, you know, if you're trying to teach people how to manage projects well, then there's this real kind of okay we've got to focus on the skills and outcomes that are relevant to that to that but if you're saying okay what we want is people to have a good time and learn how to work better at a team in a team game you know it, it, it's really uh, most games are kind of set up that way to some extent anyway so you just mm -hmm. have to kind of uh, find a new and creative way that's going to kind of work with with this team i think mm -hmm. um, so definitely I've had, I've had some great experiences with, with team building games wow so some of the things um, I'm sure you're hired to, to have people learn are more complicated things. Mm. You know, there's the, the simple, the team building probably is a lot more fun, but sometimes there's things that are more intricate or they require deeper thought or strategy. Um, how are those games designed? Are they designed any differently than just your basic game? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think the more specific the skill, the more uh, I think you can think of things along a continu continuum from game to simulation. Um, and the more specific the skill, the more it needs to be like and feel like a simulation. You know, if, if it's just something really generic like teamwork or decision making, then you can create a game with anything. You can create a game with aliens. You can create a, a game, you know, with uh, cavemen, with whatever. Um, but if it's about something really kind of technical, financial management within a certain industry or something like that, then you know, in order to get people to do the things and practice the skills and learn the new ways of doing things, it kind of ends up being a bit more like a, a kind of simulation scenario. It can be. A, an actual simulation where you're literally trying to make it as realistic as possible but even if it's not you know it's it's occupying that end of the spectrum a bit more than just a game which seems fun at the time and maybe later afterwards you're saying okay so did you see how you use that skill and that skill mm -hmm. and when the when um, companies are using these games that you're creating are they having the people play over and over again? In other words, do they just play once and learn? Or is it like, okay, we're going to play this game once a week to, to learn? Yeah, it, it varies. Um, I think some games are really designed to be played only once. And I think in a learning context, uh, that, that's perhaps more common because sometimes, you know, there's a kind of a trick or a kind of, uh, you know, an obstacle which once they've overcome it, they know how to overcome it and learning how to overcome it is part of the point. But a second time around, there wouldn't be that level of challenge, uh, which is different to a game that's just fun for its own sake, which often is balanced in such a way that, you know, people will try different strategies each time and, and you know, that they'll, they'll be able to, to get much more repeat play out of it. So, yeah, a lot of games are that way. 
but not necessarily. You can definitely have some games that you can play again and again within, within a work context. Um, but to be honest, uh, unless it's something that, that is kind of you play while you work, like for instance, some kind of thing that's attached to a sales contest, let's say, unless it's something like that, most people I think probably only want to play the game once or a few times in a short period of time and say, okay, we reached our learning goals. We got what we needed to out of that. We're now gonna turn our attention somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a similar question, but are there games that are just um, evergreen? In other words, there's people that love to play poker, okay? And they, I mean, they play it, they master it, but they're, you never really master poker because there's people changing, there's situations changing, you're becoming more proficient. So is there games like that that people would use um, even for maybe self-learning or, you know, things? Do you know what I'm asking? Um, so I got the first part about the, 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 these games, you know, can you never really master them? There's definitely games like that. Are, are you asking about whether people play those games, so poker and go and chess and so on, for other reasons than just to play, to, to learn about themselves? I mean, right, exactly. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, certainly, I, you know, I experienced that to some extent with uh, with poker and with chess. Um, I think uh, because all the time you're learning very specific things that only apply to, say, chess, um, you're also learning things that are beyond that, you know, things about um, patterns and about strategy and about psychology, uh, which I think, yeah, they do transfer beyond that, definitely. Mm -hmm. And there's some great books, actually, now you mentioned poker, there's a, there's a couple of people who uh, write about poker, I'm just thinking, Annie Duke is, is the, the main one that I can think of, Annie Duke's written a uh, book called Thinking in Bets, which is all about how uh, her career in poker really helped her to see how to um, make really good decisions, first of all, but also to, um, to, to kind of, I'm trying to think how to explain this simply, um, so, so, so in poker, there might be a situation where you think you made the wrong decision, but actually it was just a bad turn of a card. And mm. that can happen in life as well. And, you know, to be able to control your emotions and your thinking, to be able to know when something was your fault and was the result of a bad decision, or whether it was just bad luck and therefore it's best to forget about it. You know? Got it. And what was the name of that book you said, or the person? Uh, Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. Okay. Okay. Great. So, um, so do you just work with companies? Do you ever work with children or schools? Not really. Um, <clears throat> the, I, I do have uh, a lot of connections uh, within games-based learning and within gamification, and many of those are educators and education-focused. Um, but I think you know, there is a degree of specialization there. I think people who have been doing that for years and understand that, uh, that, that sector a much better place to, to kind of work directly with it than I would be. You know, my experience is with uh, corporations and small businesses. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, any opinion at all on um, our learning systems right now for children or educational systems or any thoughts or ideas on if you were in charge, what would you do differently? <laughs> Sure. I mean, I'd qualify all of these by saying that I don't have children myself and I don't work in industry, so I only, you know, have a, a quite a secondhand picture of what goes on. But from that secondhand picture, um, I do think that we kind of stick probably, and this is obviously from my experience in the UK, but I, I don't think the US is necessarily that different. Um, I think we probably stick to what worked many years ago a little bit too much. Um, I think there's been so many advances in understanding how learning works and, and doesn't. Um, and what topics are relevant for modern life. Um, and there's a little bit of inertia there that people, I think, you know, think, well, you know, the, these things worked for me when I was a kid or when my grandfather was a kid, you know, so what, why should we change them? Got it. Now, in your bio, you talked about dogs, and dogs are very important in your life. So I'm just going to open the floor and, and Tell me about dogs and how important they are and why, you know, you love having them in your life. Yeah, no, that, I mean, uh, me talking about dogs, partly because they're really important to me, but partly because of some of the, the questions that you, you were asking were about, you know, what gives life kind of fulfillment or joy or things like this. And, and for me, dogs is one of the things that comes to, to mind there. Um, 
I think for me, the, the, the huge thing about dogs and, and in particular humans, pe people's relationships with dogs is there's a kind of purity there. You know, you see these videos online of like a, a dog uh, greeting, you know, uh, the, the, their owner who's a, a soldier just come back from a tour of duty or something. And it, there's almost nothing that pure in kind of human to human relationships. You know, so it, there's always some level of, oh, I need to be thinking about how I look or whether this is okay to say or whatever. And with dogs, there's none of that. It's just, okay, this is pure love and joy and, and those kind of things. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, are you a dog trainer? Do you train, have you trained your dog? No, no. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that some of the things I know from training might transfer across, but I also know there's a lot of specialism and, and a lot of learning there that I don't have. Um, so at the moment, uh, I, uh, we don't own a dog. Um, it's not my wife and I, uh, our living situation uh, up until recently hasn't been appropriate to that. But we do, uh, there's, a, there's a thing called Borrow My Doggy. I don't know if the US has something similar. Oh. Uh, so we do that and I've got a, a doggy that, you know, we're, we're very much in love with and uh, we walk often and, uh, and you know, he's always really pleased to see me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, I, I get my doggy fix uh, and hopefully there's a the change that's coming in our, in our living circumstances pretty soon. Uh, that should mean we, we can get our own dog as well. Okay, that, that is wonderful. And while we're on that topic, so what does give you the most joy and happiness in your life besides dogs? Um, I think probably, uh, I mean, my, my relationship with my wife, definitely. Uh, but in general, with people, friends, uh, you know, um, I, I think that's one of the reasons that, that uh, I've enjoyed my job and my career so much is that it is working with, with people. Um, and I, I get a kick out of, you know, really make a connection uh, with people. Um, so that and, and games in general, I have to say. Uh, so, you know, games in a work context is one thing. But as we were saying earlier, you know, I've played games basically my whole life. Uh, and I love doing that, whether it's uh, computer games on my own or whether it's games with other people, which actually ticks both of those last two boxes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So uh, why don't you at this point tell us, you know, who your um, target market is, who do you work with? And if they wanted to work with you, how do they get a hold of you? How do they contact you? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, my target market uh, has for a long time been uh, corporations, businesses, uh, or public sector organizations who, you know, have people that need particular skills, uh, particular learning. Uh, I'm kind of at the moment uh, focusing a little bit as well on trainers themselves and learning designers and helping them to do some of the things that I do, helping them to, to design games uh, and to, to have games to, to put into action in their own learning experiences. So, so kind of uh, corporate learning and development departments, basically, plus anyone who's involved in training, training design. Um, and if those people, you know, and, and if those people are interested in uh, me helping them either with consultancy, with design, or with some of the products uh, that I'm uh, currently uh, selling or, or in the process of putting online, uh, kind of learning games or tools to help learning designers, then they can find me at um, untoldplay.com, which is my website. So my company is called Untold Play. Um, or they can find me on LinkedIn. So Terry Pierce, or if you, if you Google Terry Pierce and Tom Play on LinkedIn, uh, then that's probably the easiest way. I do also have a YouTube channel. You can look at uh, Untold Play on YouTube. Um, those are probably the easiest. There's, there's other social media as well, but those are probably the easiest. All right, well, wonderful. And thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for talking to us about play and games and creativity. I just loved it. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, so I have one last question. Great. What is your best advice for living an incredible, amazing life? Yeah, I think um, for me, uh, probably the biggest thing is presence. I think when I find myself not living an incredible life and not enjoying myself, it's often because my brain, for some reason, has wandered back to something in the past that it's kind of gnawing at or something in the future that it's worried about, that I'm worried about. Um, and I think if I, you know, managed to plant my feet back in the present and say, okay, what am I doing now? What do I wanna do now? What will help me uh, to do now? Um, then that 
tends to center me and get me better. So I think, yeah, the biggest thing for me is probably presence. Um, aside from that, probably get a dog. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. And, you know, my purpose in create, creating an incredible life is to encourage people to do that, to find their purpose, to find their passion and to live it. So thank you so much, Terry, and we'll talk to you again soon. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kimberly.